week on Making Contact. Nếu biết thì làm sao là biết mà ảnh hưởng đến con cá. If I knew it was contaminated, I wouldn't have worked there. If I knew it was going to affect my children, I wouldn't have had them. Vietnamese, you know, they have three million people who are suffering from the effects of Agent Orange. So you see these children with missing arms and missing legs and blind and huge heads. And you have to ask, well, if it's not Agent Orange, if this is not uh, what's causing these problems, what is? Wars are rarely over when they're officially over. On this edition, combat, chemicals, and corporations. We'll look at the multi-generational legacy of Agent Orange, a toxic defoliant used by the United States military in the jungles of Vietnam. I'm Lisa Rudman, and this is Making Contact, with a specially curated program of reports and interviews. Many Vietnamese call it the American War. And in the 1960s, the U.S. military used aircraft to spray over 13 million gallons of toxic herbicides over the countryside. Their aim? to strip the leafy jungle cover which hid the Viet Cong guerrilla fighters of the National Liberation Front. The chemicals destroyed crops that the Viet Cong relied on for food. It also landed on soldiers and civilians from both sides. As a young man, Nyong Tang Yan witnessed the results of that chemical warfare. And for decades, he's been raising public awareness via lawsuits, legislation, and grassroots organizing. Now goal is uh, to um, to raise issue of agent orange uh, in the US uh, for uh, Vietnam vets and their children and also for Vietnamese Americans and the Vietnamese in Vietnam and the warning about the environmental disaster that uh, agent orange was still causing in Vietnam in uh, over 20 hotspot um, meaning that uh, uh, when the U.S. left, uh, it buried uh, the the Agent Orange drum underground, and it broke up, and then it got into a um, water system in Vietnam. Nyo Tung Young is the co-coordinator of the Vietnam Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign. They travel across the U.S. with a tour of vets, their children, and Vietnamese who are suffering from Agent Orange-related birth defects. Juan Ha was also interested in exploring the effects of Agent Orange. In 2010, she produced a radio series as part of the Vietnam Reporting Project at the Renaissance Journalism Center. Wan Ha first brings us into a small home in the Quang Yam Valley of central Vietnam. The recorded Buddhist chant is supposed to help ease Bui Tui Sun into the next world. A non-smoker, he's dying of lung cancer. His wife keeps vigil. We don't have anything left. We sown our rice fields to care for him as much as we can. With no rice fields and no income, the extended family must help care for Son and his wife. Son's wife says he was in pain for more than a year but couldn't afford to see a doctor. He lies on a bed made of wood planks. Son believes he was exposed to Agent Orange while spying for the Americans in the jungles of Quang Nam Valley in central Vietnam. Son's cousin, Bui Dick Thanh, speaks for him. He's told us many times that I did what the Americans asked me to do and did it well. But after the war, they don't know my name. They've abandoned me and have no concern for me. Today, California recognizes dioxin, a toxic chemical in Agent Orange, as known to cause cancer and developmental harm. But when American planes soaked this valley with Agent Orange, says Chuck Palazzo, a former Marine who lives in Da Nang, there was scant information about its health effects. One of the things that I, I think about probably daily is what our commanding officers told us about this stuff. Essentially, and it's so safe you can drink it. It wasn't uncommon for Vietnamese to reuse the metal drums that held Agent Orange as drinking water barrels. South Vietnamese soldiers recall patrolling the jungles wet to the skin with the chemicals. Others loaded and unloaded Agent Orange with no protective equipment. A heavy rain falls on Huynh Văn Yen's hut. Yen, a former infantryman who patrolled the jungles alongside Americans, remembers the mist of chemicals settling on him. 
tôi quỳnh dẫn On the family altar are grainy photos of five children. His wife, Jung Thi Loan, speaks about them in whispers and shudders at their memory. Their legs and feet were contorted. Their eyes protruded. They protruded and were big. The children die before they were four years old. Another five children survived but are mentally challenged. They now receive monthly government stipends of about five dollars. Luan says that recognition eased their guilt. Neighbors had shamed Yun for fighting on the U.S. side. They said we had done bad things, and my ancestors were evil, and that's why my kids were born that way. Now we know we were affected by the Agent Orange poison. Former communist soldiers get priority for medical and cash benefits. Then come civilians. Soldiers who fought for the U.S. often don't get anything, despite an order from the Vietnamese government to distribute aid even-handedly. Sometimes at the local or provincial levels, they still make a distinction. Lê Kê Sơn oversees the nation's Agent Orange program in Hanoi. It's possible that in a village, people still hate each other. You shot dead my father, my mother. So why should you get to benefit from the revolutionary regime? A former vice chair of Vietnam's Foreign Affairs Committee, Tho Nu Thi Ninh, put it this way: "It's asking a bit much, you know, a lot of generosity from us to say we'll take care of both, you know, our own soldiers and the soldiers who were fighting against us. That kind of magnanimity, in theory, I understand. In this real world, will take time." The U.S. government disputes the extent of the health impact of dioxin in Vietnam, and is reluctant to tie aid to Agent Orange. This is a point of contention between the two governments. Lê Kê Sơn. The U.S. government needs to take responsibility. You brought the Agent Orange poison here and spray it. It's about responsibility and having a conscience. The fact remains. I mean, we settled all of our war-related incidents with. Uh, with the end of the war, Michael Mihalik is the U.S. ambassador in Hanoi. He says Congress has spent 46 million dollars in Vietnam over the last decade to help the broader group of Vietnamese with disabilities. We believe that it's, uh, from a humanitarian perspective, uh, it is to the benefit of U.S.-Vietnam relations for us to deal with disabilities regardless of cause, and that's that's what we're doing. Thirty-five years after the war, the scars of Agent Orange refuse to fade away. The Vietnamese say the diseases now extend well into a second generation. Juan Ha's report originally aired in November 2010 on KQED's The California Report. We'll share more of her reports later in the program. But first, let's hear from Fred Wilcox, author of several books on the legacy of Agent Orange that include Scorched Earth and Waiting for an Army to Die. He spoke with Tish Perlman. Producer and host of Out of Bounds Radio. I have to start with this question: Why is it that you have focused so much of your life on Vietnam? Well, I think because that war was the defining moment in some ways. You might put it that way for my generation. In other words, we grew up. I did as true believers. We believed that, that the president was next to God. That Congress wouldn't lie. Uh, we were anti-communist. We were everything that we were told uh, to be. And then. Uh, our illusions, our beliefs, are uh, were shattered by what uh, went on in Vietnam. Let's talk about the the legacy of chemical warfare in Vietnam. Tell us from your first book when you first started writing about this and and researching it. What was the original reason for using this? Well, the original reason uh, Kennedy signed off of in 1961. The original reason was to defoliate the jungles, to destroy the jungles and the mangrove forests uh, where our uh, America's enemy, supposedly the Viet Cong, were hiding. Mm -hmm. Then we'd drive them out in the open. This is military strategy, and with our superior fire. Power, we could kill them. For many years, I think I and a lot of other people failed to acknowledge the extent to which herbicides were used to kill food crops. Mm -hmm. Because while we did kill the trees, we did kill the forests, and did kill the jungles, at some point, somebody, uh, some people, made up their mind that uh, the Vietnamese were not cooperating with us. They weren't really supporting us in a way that we wanted to support. And also, we knew, I think, the government knew that they were they were the Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to drive the people into cities, get them off the land. 
They weren't going to leave just because we bombed them and strafed them and napalm them. They weren't leaving. So at some point, they were going to use herbicides to destroy food crops. Well, will you talk about how the jungles and the forests have turned into real toxic graveyards through this? Mm -hmm. To yeah. talk to us about the lasting damage. Well, Agent Orange was a combination of 2,4,5-T and 2,4-D, which were just commonly used herbicides here. The problem, uh, the way we used it in Vietnam is we used it in, you know, thousands of times more concentrated uh, way. And so we sprayed some areas, typically in canopy jungles, more than once, three times, four times, five times, until they died. Now, again, the government said, well, not to worry. These trees would come back. They would grow. They'd be fine. Well, they haven't grown back, and they may never grow back. If they do grow back, it'll probably be another 100 years before they return. So the jungles in Vietnam, where there used to be these majestic jungles full of elephants and tigers and all kinds of animals, uh, there's basically just grass. The Vietnamese call it American grass. Is this tall grass. Places like Da Nang, outside of Da Nang, where we had a, an enormous military base and a lot of herbicide missions were flown from there. Sign is still fine outside of Da Nang in the uh, fatty tissues, sometimes the blood, the water, and the food that Vietnamese eat. They find high concentrations of dioxin, and dioxin was the carcinogenic substance and possibly mutagenic substance in uh, Agent Orange. So the longevity of dioxin in Vietnam is absolutely incredible. I don't know if anybody ever expected it decades after the last spray mission that we would still be finding it in high concentrations in certain parts of, of Vietnam. We'll hear more from Fred Wilcox later in our program. And you can hear the whole interview at outofboundsradioshow.com. You're listening to Making Contact. Because of generous donations from listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or to get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. Almost 40 years after the war in Vietnam officially ended, Agent Orange still pervades the soil. In 2007 and 2009, Congress allocated money to clean up docks and contaminate the land. The first project began at the Da Nang Airport in central Vietnam, where KQED's Juan Ha takes us next. Walk one football field from the runway at Da Nang Airport in central Vietnam, and the terrain is rugged. We shove aside grass taller than our heads. We're wearing plastic boots to protect us from the toxic dirt. This is the storage area here to our left. That's Randa Shashakli with CDM International. The U.S. government contracted with CDM to clean up the dioxin that taints the airport grounds. We step into the clearing, and the air reeks of solvent from the chemicals saturating the soil. We are standing on what was what we call the former storage area where Agent Orange was stored in 55-gallon metal barrels and uh, and then transported somehow from this area to the, the runway area to put it on the airplanes. The ground is barren. We're surrounded by tall grasses. So obviously there's something in the soil that's preventing um, vegetation to naturally grow here. Soil tests show this and other areas of the former military base contain dioxin levels up to 360 times higher than what California allows in commercial sites. If I knew it was contaminated, I wouldn't have worked there. If I knew it was going to affect my children, I wouldn't have had them. Nguyen Van Dung had two children after he started working at the airport and eating fish and duck from nearby Sen Lake. The animals have high dioxin levels from contaminated sediment, runoff from the airport. A 2009 study by the Canadian environmental firm Hatfield Consultants found residents here had dioxin levels 10 times higher than most Americans. <laughs> At Jung's home, we're greeted by Jang, his only healthy child, born before he began the airport job. Jung dug ditches that funneled water and sediment to the lake and cleaned out the mud-clogged sewers. He spent his days in soil contaminated with dioxin. His second daughter died when she was seven. My daughter died, and now my son is very sick. My son doesn't have bone marrow, so we take him to the hospital for blood transfusions. Jung says Vietnamese doctors and scientists have told him his children's rare bone and blood diseases are because of his dioxin exposure. Jung shows me a picture of his two-year-old son. 
His head is slightly misshapen, and his eyes seem too large for their sockets. At the new year, his mother took him to get photographed. That way, we have a nice photo of him to display on the family altar. We know he's not going to live very long. Beyond a wall that separates Jung's neighborhood from the airport, researchers are drilling to find out how far down the dioxin has gone into the soil. In 2007, the U.S. Congress appropriated $12 million for the cleanup of the airbase, and remediation assessments began a year later. The plan is to scoop up all the contaminated soil and sediment and move it into a landfill. Then it'll get baked at high heat for three years until the dioxin dissipates. Michael Mahalik is the American ambassador to Vietnam. This is a persistent organic pollutant under UN standards, and we think it's a very valuable thing to get rid of pollutants like that because they're dangerous. So far, the U.S. government has committed less than half of the $34 million needed to clean up Da Nang Airport alone. Vietnamese-like environmentalist Va Quy is a prominent voice among scientists and policymakers calling on the U.S. to commit $300 million for health care and cleanup over the next decade. It's about moral responsibility and fairness. The Americans caused this problem. The U.S. government and U.S. people must take responsibility to help Vietnam solve this problem. There are still about two dozen former U.S. military bases that have elevated levels of dioxin. And swaths of South Vietnam are still scarred. The forest is our treasure. The thing we love the most, it gave us trees, it held back the rain. But after the war, it gave us nothing. In the village of Maulan, Bui Đức Than says a way of life has been lost. The forest has changed, and in my soul, I don't feel as happy. Before the war and the spraying of the poison, you could go into the beautiful forest, swim in the springs, and write poems about it. Now it seems very empty. It's unclear whether the U.S. will foot the bill to clean up other military bases or help restore the pre-war ecosystem. Ambassador Mahalik. We have been asked to take care of Da Nang, and I think within the next two or three years, we will take care of Da Nang. And beyond Da Nang? Beyond Da Nang? We'll see. We'll see. For Vietnamese here and in the United States, whose lives have been touched by Agent Orange, the wait continues. You can hear Wan Ha's other reports as well as photos online at the Vietnam Reporting Project.org. And now we'll rejoin Tish Perlman's discussion with author and scholar Fred Wilcox. I was wondering before we decided to throw all of these chemicals on an innocent land in many ways, mm -hmm. did we know what the repercussions would be? Was there ever tests on, on what this would do to humans? Uh, when you say we, the chemical companies did. They had done testing on laboratory animals, mice and rats, and so they knew that uh, dioxin was teratogenic. That is to say, if you give a tiny little bit of dioxin to a mouse uh, that's pregnant, then the offspring will be born with blind, uh, cleft palates, missing heads, all sorts of terrible <sighs> deformities, all right? They knew dioxin uh, was potentially deadly to human beings. That is a memo from Dow Chemical in 1965. Dow and probably the other chemical companies knew just how deadly dioxin uh, is to human beings. And, yeah, and you think people didn't care or they just didn't they disclose all the information? They did it? not disclose all the information. They were making a lot of money. I mean, mm -hmm. they, we used 20 million gallons in Vietnam, so they sold. Nobody knows exactly how many except Dow Chemical and Monsanto and the other chemical companies. They know, but they sold millions and millions, tens of millions of gallons of this stuff, and they could not make it fast enough. The government was using it. The military was using it so fast. The chemical companies couldn't make it fast enough, so they were making a lot of money. It was all about profit. I don't really think they cared about our troops. I don't really think they cared about the Vietnamese. I don't think they really cared about anything except money. Profit, profit, yeah. indeed. Let's go back to that book, Waiting for the Army to Die. You chronicled the effects of Agent Orange on some of our own, own right. soldiers. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you found. Well, I started the research around 1981, mm -hmm. and so I 
wandered around the country and I talked to Vietnam veterans and I would talk to these guys who were sick, their friends were dying, uh, they knew women who had, uh, had several children with birth defects or miscarriages. And as I talked to uh, scientists and, and other people who had done research into dioxin and its effects on animals, I began to see that there was an enormous tragedy. I began to see that these guys were telling the truth. And uh, one of the most interesting things about Waiting for an Army to Die to me is uh, I didn't have a title for the book. And I would ask uh, these young vets, uh, I'd say, well, what's going on? You served your country, better or worse. And I told them I was opposed to the war. And yet uh, the government's not uh, treating you kindly. It's not helping you. It's not listening to you. In fact, it's denying your claims for disability and they all said every single person said they're just waiting for us all to die <sighs> so that's where the, t the title for the book came, uh, came oh, from that's a great title so how do we know that some of this has to do with agent orange though i mean is, isn't that mm -hmm. the dispute in the medical and the, in the scientific community there's no really great way to prove that some of this is chemical toxins there's real, no real dispute within the medical or scientific mm -hmm. community that, that dioxin is uh deadly to human beings particularly mm -hmm. the kind of dioxin that 75 different compounds, but the compound that was in Agent Orange's uh, TCDD dioxin, that is the most deadly. The laboratory uh, evidence is overwhelming. Uh, give it to monkeys, mice, rats, mm -hmm. whatever you, uh, any kind of animal that you give this to, it kills them, it destroys their immune systems. So the laboratory evidence, if you extrapolate from that to our vets, Korean vets who served in Vietnam, Australian vets, vets from New Zealand, the Vietnamese people, uh, people other uh, places who have been exposed to uh, dioxin. It's just overwhelming. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, there really can't be, as far as I'm concerned, any other answer. The Vietnamese, you know, they have m three million people who are suffering from the effects of Agent Orange. They have 500,000 children who are suffering from the effects of Agent Orange. So you go there, as I have, and you see these children with missing arms and missing legs and blind and huge heads and you have to ask well if it's not agent orange if this is not uh, what's causing these problems what is and certainly the chemical companies have not gone to Vietnam. They've not done any research. They simply deny that uh, what I'm saying and many other people around the world have said about uh, dioxin is true. But I would uh, like those chemical companies, Dow and others, to go to Vietnam, do the research, and then come back and tell uh, people, no, there's no evidence that dioxin yeah. harms human yeah. beings. That was Fred Wilcox speaking with Tish Perlman of Out of Bounds Radio. The United States government and the chemical companies have never accepted responsibility for Agent Orange victims. American vets have campaigned and sued chemical companies to obtain medical treatment. But what about the thousands of Vietnamese Americans who fought alongside the U.S. troops? KQED reporter Juan Ha brings us a story of some of these people who are speaking out after decades of silence. Good morning, Dr. Rhee. Yeah, hello. Seven so years ago, doctors at the now. Silicon Valley Hospital told Le Guin he had both prostate cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. They gave him only months to live. Uh, the doctor said it was too late. He said the cancer was at the last stage and had spread. Luck says he had not seen a doctor earlier because he couldn't afford it. When Luck got the diagnosis, he was divorced and living alone in a rented bedroom. His two sons had died when they tried to escape Vietnam by boat. Luck says he had nothing left in life. I just wanted to die. I come here and I don't have a home. My children were lost at sea. I'm very sad in my old age. It was a phone call from retired Army General Louis Wagner that motivated Luke to get treatment. Luke had been a translator for Wagner in Vietnam. He just thought he'd give up, and I talked to him quite a while to convince him that he should undergo the treatment, that he could lick it and survive because I had. Wagner was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2001 and says he's convinced the two men's cancers are related to their exposure to Agent Orange. Soldiers frequently got the chemical on their skin and clothing when mixing it or patrolling jungles wet from a spray. Louis Wagner. We actually sprayed it with hand sprayers around our own compound. Obviously, when it was uh, being sprayed, uh, you were going to breathe it. 
The two men's battles with cancer reveal the inequities between South Vietnamese and U.S. soldiers who often fought side by side. American vets who served on the ground in Vietnam are presumed to have been exposed to dioxin, a toxic chemical associated with cancers and found in Agent Orange. Vets who have one of 15 diseases, including prostate cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, can qualify for disability compensation and medical care from the Veterans Administration. That's not the case for South Vietnamese soldiers. If you're a South Vietnamese soldier, again, you're sort of a, a man without a country. Ed Martini is a history professor at Western Michigan University. He's writing a book about the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam. There's really no benefit system available to you. You can't get the Vietnamese benefits. You can't get the American benefits. Last year, Vietnam vets received nearly $2 billion in disability payments. Research institutions from the National Academy of Sciences to UC Davis have studied how dioxin affects the health of American-born vets. But not one of the studies has involved Vietnamese-American veterans. Le Nguyen, now a naturalized American, says he feels like a second-class citizen. I paid a very high price. I come here and the American government, the Veterans Administration, they say they don't know me and they don't want to know about this issue. It's clearly a betrayal. Many Vietnamese Americans say they know former soldiers who have cancers or have died of cancer. But few speak of it. For one, it's taboo to admit having cancer. And there's political pressure within the community not to talk about Agent Orange. A choir of friends sings the South Vietnamese national anthem. They're gathered in Vicky Nguyen's San Jose home. Many Vietnamese Americans are reluctant to say anything against the U.S. government, who, after all, helped them defend their homeland. Nguyen's husband, a former soldier, and her adult daughter both died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But Nguyen said she didn't speak about it for years, not wanting to seem unpatriotic to the United States. They brought us here. I'm better off than those who stay behind. After Wynn's husband died, she got a $10,000 medical bill. No one was speaking up, so I didn't dare say anything either. You put the noose around your neck, twist your mouth shut, so you don't say anything. But I'm full of resentment. Retired four-star General Louis Wagner says the U.S. has turned its back on its allies. These Vietnamese have served alongside us and are living in the United States. I think there should be uh, some compensation for them. They're not going to get anything from Vietnam for sure. We know that. Nothing's too good for our veterans. And that same attitude should be provided to all the veterans that we've created and and those who have fought with us. Congressman Mike Honda, whose district includes San Jose, says he'll consider legislation to expand Agent Orange benefits to former South Vietnamese soldiers. One man who'd like to testify for that legislation is 38-year-old Trung from San Jose. Trung and his brother both have cancers that are on the VA list of diseases associated with Agent Orange. He says he's bitter about the U.S. neglect. I don't know. They they, t- they think much about us at all. Even, you know, we, we, we work here, we pay tax, we become, you know, U.S. citizen. I don't know. They, they care, you know. After decades of silence, Trung and other Vietnamese Americans are now beginning to demand equal treatment for the wounds of war that refuse to heal. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. The Forgotten One's a Legacy of Agent Orange is a three-part series by reporter Juan Ha. It aired on KQED's The California Report in November 2010 and is used here with KQED Public Radio's permission. www.californiareport.org Juan Ha produced her series as a fellow of the Vietnam Reporting Project, which was developed by the Renaissance Journalism Project at San Francisco State University and funded by the Ford Foundation. Special thanks to Tish Perlman and Nate Richardson of the Out of Bounds Radio Show.com. I'm Lisa Rudman, and thanks for listening. Good morning. Love KPFA. I'm listening to Upfront. Thank you for your wonderful show. I just love Tom Mussolini. The Booth by the Bay is my favorite show, and I love him, and I just listen to him every Saturday. Brother K, it was the best music I've ever heard. That was the best reggae show. I I got a total healing off that. That was great. Thank you for the hour special of Twitwit Radio. It's most enjoyable. 
but I just listened to education today, and it's just such a wonderful program. Packed so much in that half hour. Also, I put in Voices in the Middle East, which is one of my favorite programs. Thank you so much, and thank you for everybody's good work. I'm bound to thank you for it. Thanks for making KPFA your station. Please continue your support by making a donation at kpfa.org. And thank you for your support. And good afternoon. You are listening to 94.1 FM KPFA here in Berkeley, 